we've invited quite a few people and it's lovely to see um, or see the names anyway listed of lots of people who've joined both from um, within the, the group at WMG but also from why you're afield so I'll welcome everybody um, to this uh, workshop session so thank you very much for joining and um, I don't think we need to worry too much about an introduction apart from to say that um, it, Harry is in my opinion one of the biggest experts in, in steel and across such a wide range that it's a huge benefit for all of us to hear some thoughts and I'm particularly looking forward to the topic because it's not one I've ever heard you speak on before Harry so I think it'll be very interesting so without any more to do please Harry we'll, we'll pass over to you okay thank you very much and I hope I live up to the introduction um, I'm going to talk about the magnetic properties of austenite and I will be recording this lecture for my YouTube channel. Uh, this is a subject which uh, has been intensely studied actually, uh, well outside of the field of uh, metallurgy. Uh, and there are aspects of it which are kind of lost in the literature. But I'm going to show you, first of all, the consequences of the magnetic properties of austenite, even when the austenite is not attracted by a magnet as a ferromagnet would be. And right at the end of the lecture, I'm going to propose a brand new research idea, which I hope somebody will take up, okay? So, magnetic properties of austenite. The first thing you notice when you do a dilatometric experiment, uh, this is a standard experiment where we heat up a sample which might contain ferrite and cementite and you get a contraction when austenite forms and then you take it up to the austenitizing temperature, you cool it and depending on the rate eventually you get a phase transformation occurring back to ferrite with an expansion over here. And there are two things to notice on this um, uh, graph which you must have all have seen the first is that the thermal expansion coefficient of ferrite is smaller than the thermal expansion coefficient of austenite by quite a large difference. Okay, so this is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 5 per Kelvin, and austenite would be 1.8 times 10 to the mi minus 5 per Kelvin. And of course, uh, because of this difference in the expansion coefficient, uh, the volume change accompanying the phase transformation will be different at high temperatures and at low temperatures. The difference will be much larger at low temperatures than at high temperatures. If, if they had the same expansion coefficient, we would get the same volume change irrespective of temperature. Now, this difference in expansion coefficient has had massive consequences in the construction of power plant. And the particular part of the power plant that uh, I want to show you is known as the steam header, which is the bit which is under high pressure steam and high temperature and distributes uh, uh, the fluid to various locations. So this is a picture that my colleague at Mitsubishi Heavy Industries provided me with. And you can see the size of these objects and they are very thick as well. And they are essentially made out of ferritic martensitic steels. Uh, for example, the so-called uh, P90 and P91 and, and so forth. In other words, uh, nine chrome one moly or two and a quarter chrome one moly or 12 chrome uh, moly, etc. You can find a lot of literature on the steels which are creep resistant and based on iron chrome moly with essentially a ferritic structure with lots of carbide dispersed in between. Now there was an attempt uh, to make this out of austenitic stainless steel. The reason being that intrinsically at high temperatures, austenite is much more creep resistant than ferrite. When I talk about high temperatures, I mean temperatures above uh, something like 600 degrees centigrade. So why don't we make these out of um, 
stain, austenitic stainless steels because we actually want to go to much higher steam temperatures and pressures, as I will explain later. So in 1960, the Addiston power plant in the US had one part constructed uh, from austenitic steel. It was a 316 type austenitic stainless steel with a, a steam pressure of 34 megapascals, huge, okay, and a steam temperature of 650 degrees centigrade. And it was found to um, deteriorate dramatically with substantial damage to the header, the main steam pipes and valves as a consequence of thermal fatigue and creep fatigue driven by two factors. One is the large thermal expansion coefficient of austenite, which means that when you cycle uh, the temperature, you effectively get uh, uh, stresses building up when there are thick sections. And the thick section doesn't also help when you know, the thermal conductivity of austenite is lower than that of ferrite. So the conclusion from this was that it is not possible to use austenitic steels in thick components that undergo repeated thermal cycles, even though they have a greater creep strength than ferritic alloys at temperatures above 650 degrees centigrade. And you know, there have been massive programs in uh, Europe, Japan, uh, USA, and later on China to make steels which are capable of surviving temperatures of the order of 650 degrees, 700 degrees centigrade, uh, which would have sufficient creep rupture strength to bear a stress of 100 megapascal over a period of 100,000 hours. Uh, that's a sort of a criterion used to assess steels. They have all been unsuccessful, okay? The best we can do is of the order of 620 degrees centigrade or 630 degrees centigrade. The ferritic steels simply do not have the creep resistance required, uh, nor do they have the microstructural stability. Actually, the two things go together. So it would be wonderful if we could create uh, austenitic steels, which do not have a large thermal expansion coefficient. Now, before I go on to that, I'm going to explain some of the basics of magnetism. So these are some of the magnetic states where in a ferromagnetic material, the unpaired electrons have their spins aligned. Uh, all of them are aligned and of equal uh, magnitude on each atom. And we call that ferromagnetic. And of course, ferrite is well known to be ferromagnetic. If you put a magnet next to it, the ferrite will be attracted to it. You also have antiferromagnetic, where you know the unpaired spins are pointing, uh, magnetic spins are pointing in different directions. Uh, ferromagnetic is when these are not of the same magnitude. And paramagnetism uh, is Basically when, uh, so you wouldn't attract your material by placing a magnet next to it. And paramagnetism is, an, is a kind of an induced magnetism. So if you apply a field to your material, then the spins which are along the field will decrease in energy and the spins which are opposing it will increase in energy and in an attempt for uh, in an attempt to obtain the same Fermi potential, you will be left with some unspin paired electrons, even though in the material without the field, there were no unspin paired electrons. Okay? So it's a relatively weak effect and it's made weaker by another effect known as uh, diamagnetism, which exists in all materials. That means if you place a magnetic field uh, next to the material, then the electrons in the material effectively uh, go into a spiral motion, exactly like uh, in a transmission electron microscope. The electrons are not moving in straight lines down the column. They are influenced by the magnetic fields and are spiraling down the columns. So that is the reason why uh, the electron diffraction pattern is actually rotated with respect to the image because the lenses that are used to project the electron diffraction pattern on the, onto your screen 
uh, have different settings from when you want to project the image onto the screen. So you're cutting off the spiral at different locations and therefore the pattern will be rotated relative to your image. And modern microscopes, the very modern microscopes would correct for that rotation. So you don't need to worry about it. But when I did my PhD, we had calibrations on how the electron diffraction pattern was rotated relative to the image. So in a diamagnetic material, the field induces the electrons to go in spirals. And that in turn by Lenz's law produces uh, a field which opposes the applied magnetic field. So it repels it. And that part uh, counteracts what you get from paramagnetism in a paramagnetic material. So these are the basic uh, uh, magnetic structures that we are interested in. And today my focus is on these two ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic, although of course this exists when you are above the ordering temperature in both of these cases. In this case, uh, the ordering temperature would be known as the Curie temperature, and in this case it's known as the Neal temperature. And without going into details at the moment, uh, I will develop this subject uh, as the talk progresses. The large thermal expansivity of austenite is entirely due to its magnetic properties, okay, um, uh, when we compare it against uh, ferrite. There are some strange things that happen with austenite. So, austenite that is alloyed with manganese can exhibit antiferromagnetic ordering. Uh, in contrast, when alloyed with nickel, uh, above a certain concentration, you get ferromagnetic ordering. And you also get cases where a single crystal of austenite is magnetically heterogeneous. That means within a single crystal, you have variations in the alignment of spins. It could be, you know, mixture of antiferromagnetic and ferromagnetic or paramagnetic and antiferromagnetic and so on. So that is a concept that we don't normally uh, teach in materials, but it's possible in a single crystal to get two different states of ordering. And that will influence things like the energy uh, of the, each of those regions and also the volume of each of those regions because the magnetic properties are not independent of all the other parameters that determine structure. And a single crystal of austenite in pure iron is simultaneously in two electronic states, a mixture of ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic. And I'll show you the evidence for this. Now, of course, um, this looks, looks strange at first sight, but it isn't really an alien concept. So for example, manganese oxides have magnetic phase separation at short length scales. You know, it's, it's rather like a, a spinodal decomposition where uh, the normal spinodal decomposition, we talk about, you know, composition rich and composition poor regions. Here we talk about, you know, different magnetic phases, for example, antiphase, uh, antiferromagnetic, ferromagnetic, etc. And these clusters of antiferromagnetic and ferromagnetic domain have actually been observed to coexist in the manganese perovskites. Perovskites are a kind of oxide. Similarly, uh, in iron copper alloys, uh, we, have si uh, we have the same kind of observation. And you might argue that, look, we can't really make iron copper alloys, but these are alloys which are made by mechanically alloying so that we can introduce large concentrations of copper into the iron lattice. And indeed, manganese, chromium, cobalt, and nickel show the same two-state phenomenon, but all in, in, in these cases, there are much weaker effects uh, for various reasons. Iron has the largest uh, Bohr magneton per atom. Now, just to go a bit further, to convince you of this, that in pure iron, we have a combination of ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic regions with different characteristics in terms of density. Uh, I'll show you a phase diagram, but it's a different kind of phase diagram. It's a magnetic phase diagram. 
So here is a magnetic phase diagram where we're keeping the iron concentration constant at 50 atomic percent, and we are varying the nickel to manganese ratio along this uh, uh, horizontal axis. And, you know, antiferromagnetic, uh, paramagnetic, paramagnetic, here's a two-phase field which has ferromagnetic and paramagnetic. And here is a domain which is a mixture of antiferromagnetic and ferromagnetic in the same single crystal, okay? These shaded areas are simply regions of uncertainty. So this has been known for quite a long time that you can get a mixture of magnetic domains in a single crystal of material. And we are of course interested in pure iron and by using uh, experimental measurements of electrical resistivity, neutron diffraction, it has been demonstrated that an atom of austenite at high temperatures has 2.3 Bohr magnetons per atom. That's a very large uh, amount of magnetic spin per atom. It's similar to that of ferrite. So um, austenite has a spin which is similar to that of ferrite at high temperatures and the Curie temperature is about 1800 Kelvin, okay? Using MOS power neutron diffraction, uh, when we go to temperatures which are not far from zero Kelvin, austenite has a much smaller spin, okay? 0.6 Bohr magnetons per atom and is antiferromagnetic. This is ferromagnetic. So the Neel temperature here is 50 to 80 Kelvin. Now, how do we know this? Well, you can actually retain pure iron in the austenitic state to a low temperature, right? You know, what you do is you precipitate the iron inside copper and that those iron particles are coherent with the copper, copper lattice. So they remain retained inside the copper when you cool them to ambient temperature or lower. So it's possible to get pure iron in its austenitic form at low temperatures by doing this. So the experiments have been done to show uh, both the antiferromagnetic and the ferromagnetic states of austenite at these two temperatures. Now, in the case of antiferromagnetism, you know, the, the spins are, um, if I go back to this slide, these are not aligned. And there is a, a particular arrangement of spins necessary on the FCC lattice to achieve this. And here is a diagram uh, showing that. So this is one unit cell of the face-centered cubic lattice where the shaded atoms here are at a height half normal to the diagram. And the unshaded atoms are at zero and height one to make a projection of the FCC lattice onto the uh, basal plane or the 001 plane. And the plus and minus refer to the spins of uh, the magnetic spins of the atoms. The one at the bottom at zero has a plus spin and the one at the top has a minus. This is a minus and so on. So you see, this is our lattice parameter that we measure using X-ray diffraction, but it no longer is the case that this is equivalent to this or this, right? So they, these cannot be regarded as lattice points if you take account of the magnetic characteristics. The magnetic lattice parameter is this because now the environment of this atom is the same as the environment here and here. So, the magnetic lattice parameter is double that of the structural lattice parameter. And in neutron diffraction, the scattering power is not related so much to the atomic number as it is in X-ray diffraction, but uh, the interaction of uncharged particles with uh, nuclei. And you are able to pick up the magnetic cell parameter using neutron diffraction and show that it is double the size of the structural that is parameter, okay? So that is an accumulation of experimental evidence for the two states. Now, there was uh, amazing work done by Weiss and his co-workers, Tower and others, 
and uh, you know Weiss uh, was at the uh, materials research laboratory in uh, Watertown in the US. It was a government facility. Uh, but he did come down to the Cavendish in the uh, mid 1950s, uh, presumably on sabbatical. Did amazing work on this two state model of austenite where both of these states coexist, okay? And the ground state, because you know, at very low temperatures, we get antiferromagnetic austenite. The ground state is, we call gamma naught and has a high density. And the thermally excited state, gamma one, is ferromagnetic with a low density. And he developed the theory to treat this. Uh, now, in order to get from this state to this state is not difficult. It only requires a shift of an electron from one half of the D band to the other half to convert from the antiferromagnetic to ferromagnetic. And the theory that was presented by um, Kaufman, Clarity, and Weiss on this uh, included a huge number of thermodynamic uh, measurements as well. Is that look, we've got these two states the ground state here, which is antiferromagnetic, and this is the um, thermally excited stage, which is ferromagnetic, and there's a difference in energy, which is E1. And using a standard theory uh, of the distribution of uh, atoms between these two states, uh, G, G is simply the degeneracy of the state. That means the number of states we have at this energy level, okay? and it can be different from the ground state. Uh, but in this case, uh, you, know, you can have as many states here and here. But if these are electrons, you can only have two here and two here. Uh, that's diverting a bit, all right? So, Using uh, an equation like this, where this is the number of atoms in the ground state over the total number, is given by the degeneracy here over the partition function. This is called the partition function because it, it's basically describing the distribution of atoms between the two different states. Uh, you can calculate the number of atoms in each of these states as a function of temperature which is extremely useful, okay? So this is called the Weiss uh, two-state model, and it was nicely applied to pure iron by Kaufman, uh, Clarity, and Weiss. This uh, energy difference is really important, and I'll come back to that later in the lecture. But the consequence of this is as follows, right? So if you plot the molar volume, in other words, uh, you know, molar volume high, density low, uh, tem versus temperature. Then these two states have different volumes. The low density, um, high volume, sorry, um, the low volume, high density state is here, and the high volume, low density state is here, which is uh, the ferromagnetic state and the antiferromagnetic state. And what's happening as you raise the temperature is not simply thermal expansion that you get because the interatomic potential is not a parabola, but it's enharmonic. So as uh, atoms get thermally excited, you're not getting, uh, you, you get an increase in separation between the atoms. It's not simply thermal expansion but you are actually changing the proportion of the two states. And as a consequence, the mean thermal expansion that you pick up is this, which is larger than that of ferrite. But if we did not have these magnetic properties, then both ferrite and austenite would have the same thermal expansion coefficient. And notice also that the difference between ferrite and austenite is diminishing with temperature as we had in our dilatometric curve. So we now have a fundamental explanation for why the expansion coefficient of austenite is greater, very much greater than that of ferrite. Uh, it's because we don't simply have thermal expansion due to the enharmonic potential between atoms, but we also have a change 
in the relative proportions of the high volume and low volume austenites. Now, uh, I've shown you already the experimental evidence uh, and the experimental evidence can be of different kinds. For example, you can do first principles calculations. Uh, they are uh, basically don't require any inputs other than you, know, you use your electron functions to calculate the lowest energy states and so forth. Uh, and thin film experiments. Okay, so this is a set of uh, first principles calculations. Um, you know, with first principle calculations, you have no limitations. You can do really odd things like put iron into its diamond structure, which doesn't exist, and work out its energy and its lattice parameter. Okay, this is just the volume which is related to the lattice parameter. Uh, you could make it into a primitive hexagonal or whatever structure that you like and do these calculations of cohesive energy. And this is the base centered cubic that is. Now, these calculations confirm that we have these magnetic states in austenite, uh, but the Weiss zone, uh, the Weiss um, model, I think, is much better because these calculations based on first principles often neglect, uh, neglect parameters such as paramagnetism they treat the austenite instead as non-magnetic, which doesn't exist, okay? Um, or they are limited to low temperatures like zero Kelvin and zero pressure and so on. But nevertheless, okay, where it is not possible to do experiments, first principles calculations really do a good job, okay? A good job in the sense that they give us a clue and they have confirmed the existence of these states. They, they, they actually say that the magnetic properties are more complicated than just two states. But in my opinion, it doesn't matter because the additional states are too high an energy for them to actually happen in practice. So I'm going to stick to the Weiss model for this. Now, thin film experiments are interesting because when you deposit pure iron onto a substrate, the lattice parameter of the substrate is important. Uh, so if it deposits epitaxially, that means in perfect matching, then the lattice parameter of the thin film of iron is determined by that of the substrate, whether it's copper, palladium, silver, whatever. Uh, so if you deposit a film of iron, which is on a substrate, which has a larger lattice parameter than austenite, uh, then you will end up with an antiferromagnetic thin film. If you deposit it onto a substrate which has a smaller lattice parameter, then you will end up with ferromagnetic austenite. And there are two kinds of ions which have been studied extensively. One is trigonal iron, and the second is tetragonal iron. So uh, just to explain to you uh, what I'm trying to explain, the black is the FCC unit cell, okay, uh, of austenite. But inside that, I can identify a primitive unit cell of austenite, which is trigonal. So primitive means that there's only one atom inside this cell. They're only located at the corners of the cell, whereas the FCC unit cell has four atoms per unit cell. And Whereas the FCC has four threefold axes going down the body diagonals, the trigonal cell has only one, and these angles are all 60 degrees in the case of the trigonal cell. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this is that that trigonal cell basically consists of two layers of the closed packed 111 plane. Okay, so here I've outlined in blue the 111 um, plane and it takes half the atoms of the trigonal cell and then another parallel plane takes the other half of the um, atoms of the trigonal cell. So if I deposit iron onto a 111 plane of a substrate, 
then I expect to see trigonal iron because there will be a, a corresponding distortion normal to the thin film, which determines the actual structure. And you can do the same for ferrite. Ferrite also has a primitive cell, which is trigonal, but the angles are now 109 uh, um, degrees. And basically this cell here, uh, the, the uh, trigonal cell has these 110 planes, which look like the 111 planes of austenite, but the angles are, this is not a perfect hexagon. Okay, so we can then do uh, first principles calculations and measurements on, on thin films. And these are the first principles calculations. Now, this, this lattice parameter, uh, you notice that ferrite is incredibly large, but that's to allow for the fact that the ferrite unit cell has only two atoms per cell, whereas the austenite unit cell has four atoms per cell. And you can see that when the lattice parameter is small, the austenite has a low Bohr magneton per atom. But as you increase the lattice parameter of the substrate, okay, and this is still austenite-like, then you get a dramatic increase in the Bohr magneton per atom, uh, something like 2.3. And eventually, when you get to the distortion, which gives us the ferrite, uh, we have the correct prediction of the number of Bohr magnetons per atom from first principles calculations. And similarly, here's another set of calculations, but this time uh, for depositing onto the 100 face of the um, substrate. So we end up with a tetragonal uh, cell, uh, both for austenite and for ferrite. Uh, and once again, you see that at a small lattice parameter, we get the low Bohr magnetons per atom. And then you get into a place where, you know, you're between, uh, as I compress along here, uh, I get between the austenite and the ferrite. You start to get uh, lots of Bohr magnetons and ferromagnetic states, and eventually the ferrite, which we know is paramagnetic. So there is a huge amount of evidence now to support the um, fact that austenite actually has two magnetic states which are of different density and that the proportions change as you alter the temperature within a single crystal of austenite. Okay, so that, um, that basically um, is how far I want to go in today's lecture, but let's, let's see some of the consequences. So I mentioned to you that we have this problem of a large thermal expansion coefficient uh, to make components in steam power plant, which can operate at higher temperatures and higher steam pressures. And we need to do that. Uh, you know, we need to get, get to this condition where uh, the so-called ultra supercritical. So supercritical means that you are operating under conditions where there's no difference between the vapor and water forms of steam. Uh, and the pressures uh, we might want are of the order of 30 megapascals of steam pressure, okay? Now I explained to you that after many, many decades of research uh, in the US, in Europe, in Japan, and later in China, it has not been possible to find ferritic creep resistant steels which can tolerate these conditions. Okay? But of course, we know that in jet engines, we can happily use nickel based alloys, uh, which operate at much higher temperatures. So for example, these blades inside the jet engine here, they operate in an environment which is higher than the melting temperature because they contain cooling channels and also coatings. And uh, they are single crystal blades, but these are incredibly expensive, okay? So there is no possibility of using the nickel-based super alloys that are available for aero engines for the construction of power plant, absolutely no possibility, okay? So we could actually say we have failed, all right? But look, nickel has a low thermal expansion coefficient, not far off from that 
of ferrite. So if we could make a very cheap nickel alloy, then we would be winning. And many years ago, we did this. Uh, so we created an alloy which we call FT750DC. FT stands for Frank Tonkre, who was my postdoc. 750 for 750 degrees C steam temperature. And DC, because it's dirt cheap. Okay, so you should be laughing now, but your microphones are off. Uh, so the basic concept is that we don't need 70% gamma prime. We don't need elements like rhenium, cobalt, and so forth. Uh, so this is the structure where we have about 20% of uh, gamma prime. And uh, we also allow some iron, which is not good for super alloys, but it reduces the cost uh, in the sense that you can use scrap materials as well. And, you know, we had, uh, some success. So these are uh, the curves are predictions in both cases, and we managed to achieve the required required properties. But this alloy is still pretty expensive, okay, with 67 weight percent nickel and some of the other elements like titanium and, and so forth. So um, back in, uh, I think it was uh, 1980, -ish, yes. Uh, I was working on uh, trip steels and I made a tapered tensile specimen like this, okay? So that I could break it and then examine how much martensite formed as a function of stress. And this is a plot of that martensite as a function of stress. And this alloy contains 28 uh, weight percent nickel. It's martensite start temperature is minus 44 degrees centigrade. Uh, but we tested it at minus 80 to induce, um, uh, sorry, it's Martin size start temperature is minus 80, but we tested it at minus 44 so that we can be sure that all the Martin site is influenced by the deformation. And sure enough, you know, you get these nice, even in a polycrystalline alloy, you get nice alignment of plates that are favored by the stress. Now, a student from another group came to me and said, look, can I have an austenitic alloy? Didn't explain what for, but I gave him this material. A couple of days later, he comes back and says, look, uh, this cannot be austenite. It's ferromagnetic. And I explained to him that actually, you know, when you add lots of nickel to iron, you get ferromagnetic austenite. And Weiss, uh, Weiss had shown that that energy gap E1 actually decreases as you go add nickel and then becomes negative. In other words, the ferromagnetic state becomes the ground state beyond a certain concentration of nickel, right? So here we were promoting, uh, as we raise the temperature, uh, when the ground state was antiferromagnetic, we were actually promoting the low density form of austenite as the temperature increased. Here, as the temperature increases, we promote the high density antiferromagnetic uh, state of austenite uh, as the temperature increases. So nickel addition makes low density ferromagnetic gamma one the ground state and an increase in temperature promotes the high density state. And this effect of promoting the high density state can cancel out the thermal expansion. So if you look at these two curves, this is when um, the antiferromagnetic state is the ground state, and this is when the ferromagnetic state is ground state. So you almost kill the thermal expansion. And of course, this, this is known as the INVAR effect, where you can actually get a zero expansion coefficient. So it is possible to get austenite with a zero thermal expansion coefficient. And I mentioned to you uh, that we had 67% nickel in the nickel alloy that we designed. Could it be possible that we can reduce the nickel concentration dramatically and make it into an austenitic st steel, which is creep resistant? I'll come back, come back to this. Uh, and uh, I claim that there is no existing creep resistant austenitic stainless steel uh, or austenitic steel. Uh, 
which has sufficient nickel to make this thermal expansion coefficient negligible. Now, there are other consequences. So this is the heat capacity of um, ferrite. And of course, there's a massive peak at the Curie temperature. And the dashed curve here shows the, what the heat capacity would be if you did not have ferromagnetism. And this is by Kaufman, Clarty, and Weiss, okay? Me actual measurements and then deductions. So the magnetic entropy due to this disordering is massive and scales with temperature. And similarly in austenite, uh, this is without the magnetic effect and this is including the magnetic effect. So there is also a magnetic entropy when you get this disordering. What happens uh, is of course we have uh, ferrite as the stable phase at low temperatures, then we get austenite. But as the temperature continues to increase, this magnetic entropy term uh, exceeds the magnetic entropy due to the austenite and we revert back to ferrite. So iron is a most unusual material where we start off with ferrite, we go to austenite and then revert back to austenite, uh, revert back to ferrite simply because of this magnetic entropy term. And once again, if you look at first principles calculations, um, if you ignore magnetism, then hexagonal form of iron would be the most stable at ambient temperatures, right? Or, or zero Kelvin. And indeed, if you look at the periodic table, iron, ruthenium, osmium, and hasmium, these are all iron analogs in the sense that their outer electron structures are very similar, but ruthenium, osmium, and we don't know the structure of hasium because not enough can be made, but ruthenium and osmium are hexagonal closed packed, right? So just imagine, right? If we did not have ferromagnetism, uh, we would not have ferrite, okay? And one day I would like to give a talk about a world without ferrite. What would that look like, okay? Because we use approximately 1.8 billion tons of it every year. So the research idea that I want somebody to take up, okay, is to make a creep resistance austenitic steel, uh, austenitic steel, which has sufficient nickel. So to make it creep resistant is easy because the lattice itself is creep resistant, but you also can add uh, particles to it like gamma prime particles and uh, you know, the ordered uh, particles to make it creep resistant. But to achieve at the same time, a low thermal expansion coefficient at a much reduced nickel concentration than the sort of alloy I suggested earlier would be a major achievement. And I looked up today what's going on in the world of creep resistant steels for supercritical, uh, ultra supercritical power plant. And they're focusing on the nickel alloys, which are much more expensive than any of the steels. So I will end my talk now, and I hope that somebody, you know, even as a PhD project, takes up this idea of making an austenitic steel which has a lower thermal uh, low thermal expansion coefficient and yet is creep resistant, even if it contains 38% nickel. So we should not worry about 38% nickel because it's going to beat a material which is made from nickel. Okay, I'll end, end uh, the lecture now. It's given us a, a lot of food for thought and I always like these um, discussion points that can start with a practical problem, but actually they go down into the understanding of, of the why. And for me, that's the nicest thing about what, what we do is the fact that there's so much already known, but there are still so many areas where greater insight is needed that can make, can make a difference. And I hope that that's something that you know, particularly the, the research students who are listening can take away from this that it, it is about seeing a big picture but also it is really good and very important to keep going down the why question to, to delve deeper and deeper because from that we get a lot more understanding so thank you very much Harry for, for doing that um, and, and particularly showing that depth of thinking that can go behind a, a, a simple initial question of how do we solve this problem